So, so I hope that most people in the audience are familiar uh, with the three documents that have come since the beginning of the 21st century uh, dealing with the universal definition of myocardial infarction. Uh, it was an international group that started as a working uh, a project between the American College of Cardiology and the European Society of Cardiology. More recently, the American Heart Association has joined in and the World Heart Federation. Um, and these documents have been published in all of the official journals of these organizations. Uh, this, uh, you've seen already, the potential conflicts of interest. This is the criteria for acute myocardial infarction, which has not changed much. This is from the 2012 document, but basically it's the same thing. The most important point here is, of course, a rise in, and or fall, as you've already heard from Alan, uh, a delta, in uh, preferably a troponin, but that it has to be combined with one of the following. Symptoms of ischemia, electrocardiographic changes that suggest ischemia or a new left bundle, development of pathological Q waves in the ECG, imaging evidence of a new loss of viable myocardium or a new regional wall motion abnormality, and on occasion, minimal or no CAD may be seen you know, on angiography, as I'm sure you're all aware. So the so-called type 1, which you uh, heard uh, so well from Dr. Williams, is a spontaneous infarct related to atherosclerotic plaque rupture, fissuring, or dissection with resulting intraluminal throm thrombus development in one or more cor coronary arteries that leads to ischemia uh, and myocyte necrosis. The type 2 MI, um, you don't have a ruptured plaque or an ulceration. Rather, you have a, either a marked increase in myocardial oxygen demand, for example, tachycardia or hypertension, as was demonstrated in the second case by Dr. Williams, or you have decreased supply, for example, spasm, anemia, arrhythmia, hypoxemia, or hypotension. Um, the patients may or may not have coronary artery disease. Um, this little diagram shows you exactly that. Um, you can see here that uh, uh, the top one there, uh, type uh, uh, 1 MI, there's a plaque rupture with thrombus. Type 2, there's, uh, you see three examples of type 2, vasospasm or endothelial dysfunction, fixed atherosclerosis in which there's a supply-demand imbalance, or uh, angiographically normal coronaries in which there's a supply-demand imbalance. So, the characteristics which you should try and remember when you're doing this clinically is that a type 1 MI is usually spontaneous in onset. Um, the, the discomfort often develops often in the early morning hours, as has been shown in epidemiologic studies of acute MI. The underlying pathological process, again, plaque erosion, fissuring, and so forth with, with the thrombosis in the artery. Almost all STEMIs are in this category, and the patients usually do not present with a serious medical illness or a marked arrhythmia uh, leading to hypotension or hypertension, in other words, a, a supply-demand problem. The characteristics of a type 2 MI, the onset of the MI is usually in the setting of a serious medical illness, for example, hypotension, respiratory failure with marked hypoxemia, rapid tachycardia, for example, atrial fib with rapid ventricular response, patients we see every day in the hospital. The underlying pathophysiologic mechanism is not plaque rupture or fissuring with thrombosis, but markedly, markedly increased myocardial oxygen demand or markedly decreased myocardial oxygen supply. For example, severe anemia uh, secondary to a GI hemorrhage and where hypotension can also play a role. The third category was the third patient uh, that you saw uh, Dr. Williams present. A myocardial, so-called non-ischemic myocardial injury is diagnosed when an abnormal troponin value is noted, but the underlying mechanism of the cardiac injury is not ischemia. For example, cardiac trauma. There's a very good example. Um, and in many cases, for example, chronic renal failure and heart failure, blood troponin values remain elevated. There's no delta, again, as pointed out by Alan. Rather, uh, the, the rising and falling uh, does not occur as it does in patients with, uh, in which an acute ischemic injury is there. So again, just to remind you, type 1, the injury is related to primary myocardial ischemia. Type 2, the injury is related to supply-demand imbalances leading to myocardial ischemia. 
And then there can be an injury not related to myocardial ischemia, the non-ischemic uh, uh, value that we've just talked about. And then finally, you can have more than one. So somebody comes in with a STEMI, and then uh, the, the afterwards they go into rapid atrial fib, you can have of course, elevated uh, troponins and injury to the myocardium, both from the STEMI initially and then from the heart rate of 150. Um, and by the way, there's no way you can tell which one is raising the troponin because, of course, the troponin is, it, it is, goes up in, in both of these uh, situations. Just to give you a list, this is taken from the 2012 document, which again was in circulation, Jack, and so forth. And you can see that there's a long list of things that raise troponin uh, that are not uh, due to ischemic heart disease. Uh, and uh, there are things like uh, renal failure, drug toxicity, and so forth. Distinguishing MI type 1 from type 2 was the injury due to ischemia or another process, and try and guesstimate in the clinical situation what was the underlying pathophysiologic mechanism leading to it. Was it plaque rupture or a change in MVO2 demand or supply? Important to remember that type 2MI occurs perioperatively. This is associated with a worse prognosis. People have done Holter monitors during operative procedures. They often see ST segment depression. And as you know, during the operations, blood pressure rises and falls, heart rate rises and falls. And these are thought to be primarily type 2 MIs, but they are associated with a worse prognosis than the patient, the identical patient who doesn't have that elevation. Um, and again, uh, we meant just to mention the various entities where you can see ongoing injury but no delta. There's heart failure, renal failure, uh, the critically ill medical patients uh, uh, who have it as a non-ischemic event. And then, of course, procedures such as a patient goes for ablation in the, in the EP lab. You're going to see elevated troponin. This little diagram just points that out. The pink area in the middle is the true myocardial infarction where there's troponin elevation and clinical criteria. The white area is the type 2 where there's elevated troponin with uh, uh, necrosis, but there's been a change in uh, the underlying myocardial demand supply. And then finally, where the circles fall outside, there's no troponin elevation. Those are patients who haven't had any injury at all. Defining type 2 requires careful clinical correlation and thought. Many of you have heard me said between the doctor, uh, between, sorry, the patient and the guidelines, there needs to be a doctor that's thinking. Just to show you uh, some examples, there have been a number of studies looking at type 2 MI. This is the first one from Denmark um, in which uh, uh, about 26% were type 2. The type 2 patients were older, more female, because the males were dead, of course, lots of comorbidities, um, higher mortality compared with type 1. I'll show you a diagram of that. And 50% of the type 2s had normal coronary angiograms. And here's the long-term survival of patients with type 1 versus type 2. And the type 2s have much worse survival because they're sicker. They have all kinds of comorbid conditions, no surprise. And by the way, there's no difference in survival between type 2 and myocardial injury. Again, these folks are sick. Um, this is the same uh, data that Alan showed you from a different European study, just demonstrating the very excellent um, uh, sensitivity and specificity of the high sensitivity troponins. I'm not going to say more about that. Other studies have, uh, have alleged uh, type 2 MI have included patients with myocardial injury and thus have confused the delineation of patients with type 2. So, by the way, urgent coronary arteriography is almost certainly not indicated in the people with type 2 who are very sick and you can hurt them. Um, and then evaluation for CAD can be done after recovery and should be done usually by a cardiologist. And no therapeutic intervention for type 2 has been studied or suggested to be of any benefit at this time. Thank you very much.